Paul Yan is the chief creator officer and co-studio head at Toys for Bob. He has been working with Toys for Bob for almost 20 years, serving as a creative director on almost every single Skylanders title. However, in 2017, he was then promoted to chief creative officer at Toys for Bob. The very first project that he led as CCO was returning to Spyro's original roots with the Spyro Reignited trilogy. With Reignited's fifth anniversary just being right around the corner, I was able to sit down with Paul Yan to talk about Spyro Reignited's development and his potential future. Let's rewind back to, let's say, around 2017. You've just been tasked with remaking Spyro from the ground up after Vicarious Visions had just cranked out Crash Insane. What were your initial thoughts and feelings being tasked with such a project like Spyro and bringing him back? When we jump onto projects, it's a conversation between the studio and Activision. So it's not like, here's something that you are going to do. It's it's a conversation. And so when that opportunity came up, we jumped at it. We said, yeah, of course, we are huge. <laughs> We're huge fans of Spyro. So yeah, number one is excitement. You know, obviously we had familiarity with Spyro and has been a part of our, you know, the enrichment of inspiration for games that we have made, certainly with Skylanders. And so to return to the source was like, yes, what, a, what an X, of course we would want to, yes. But on the flip side of that, after saying yes, it's the, Oh, <laughs> intimidation of like, VV, they did such an amazing job. That, that is a tough act to follow. So we took that as as fuel for, you know, how to make the, the game great, but certainly it was, it's a mixed, mixed bag of emotions there. And he's exactly right. Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy really kicked off the current trend of remasters. In fact, to be honest, calling it a remaster is probably not even the correct term for what it actually is. Taking old classic games and rebuilding them from the ground up while maintaining the same structural mechanics and bones is not an easy task. And Paul recognized this very early. The term remaster is so, like, we need new words there, <laughs> right? It's so gray now. It's so gray, you know, because I think like even before, you know, the Insane Trilogy remaster kind of represented like an uprezzing of textures, in some cases like an uprezzing of, of models. But what VV did was rebuild the entire game from the ground up and using, you know, you know, references from the original source. Again, they went above and beyond and really set the pace for us. And we had a lot of admiration for what they did. We we worked with VV very closely in the past before. So the first thing that we did was we contacted our friends at VV and specifically Kara Massey. She was the, I think she was the, the lead producer on Insane Trilogy at the time. And so we said, hey, how did you guys do this? What was your <laughs> thought? But please just let, let's, we want to download everything that you've done. We want to learn what did you guys do while paul spoke with kara about how crash insane was actually executed which we're going to talk a lot more about later paul had two other problems that he had to contend with and that was development time and the sheer size and scope of the game the timeline for the project was very very aggressive the scope of these games were huge and that was another thing that we were talking with kara is like inevitably we were comparing content size between spyro and with crash for insane trilogy one of the things about spyro that makes this uniquely challenging is that because it's an open game there's a lot of ground to cover and you know back on ps1 the sparseness was great it was you know for a lot of us it was we were experiencing 3d games Gaming for the first time but today you know it's 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 a given figure out ways in which we could fill out the space with visual interest without compromising gameplay was another like big how do we do that and then when we figure out how do we do that how do we actually produce it in the time that we we need to hit for this to launch within our our targets when paul says aggressive it means that they had less time to develop this game in comparison to other projects in size and scope and of course, Spyro is much different in comparison to Crash Insane. While Crash Bandicoot has a very linear path of gameplay, Spyro is open for the player to explore, which made this task of bringing it up to a modern day even more challenging than ever. Paul and his team had to figure out how to rebuild these massive games, and he had to do it quick. However, right out of the gate, 
Paul and his team hit their very first speed bump. Some of the early work we did, we explored like some of the artisans hub world and you know, we addressed some of the norks that were like running around there. What we were doing was we had side by side comparisons of right. the source material and what we were working on. And we we're constantly looking back and forth and going, okay, that's what that is. We're gonna take that inspiration. We're gonna preserve those shapes, preserve the color palette. We're gonna, you know, add some detail here. And then we stepped back and we looked and we said, yeah, that looks great. What a difference. The Delta is great. And then this is the moment of like, aha, was we removed the source material off the screen. We just looked at it by itself. And it was like, ah, it's, it's not enough. It's just not enough. And I think that's when it was like, ah, that's what Kara was saying is that their goal was not to reproduce or to smooth out or up res the original game. Their goal was to recreate people's memories and not just their memories, but their rose tinted memories. That nuance, it it sounds like nuance. It sounds like some kind of like pithy, like, ooh, okay, <laughs> their memories. But like, it really made a difference. And I, I think like we heard it, we understood it, but we didn't, we didn't really internalize it until we started to produce some of our early tests. It's not this, it's not this interpretation of the source a one-to-one, -one, just this linear movement from the source material. It's people's memories of what that was in the, the level Toasty. That ended up being our first like first playable. You know, some, it, it set the precedence for a lot of what our production was for our levels. At that time, we had hired a ton of talented concept artists. We had really strong art direction. Even the character of Toasty, recreating it from memory. It's like you remember a scarecrow, you the facade of a scarecrow. You remember the stilts. You remember like there's hay probably spilling out all over, you know, from underneath the, the sounds of clanging from like, you know, the sheep that's underneath. And so we, we, we did that in art. We produced that. We built a, a beautiful model. And then you look back at the source and you go, man, none of those details are there. We're, <laughs> it was just from our memories of, of what that character was. And, and we kind of fill in the gaps of what was there before. And so I think that set the tone. We just threw everything at it. And so long as it honored your memories of what that source material was, and then we'd go back and make sure that it was true and it, and it wasn't something that was so unrecognizable. <laughs> that was the path for it. Recreating details through rose tinted glasses that honors that collective childhood memory of many players from around the world is a very difficult challenge within itself. Now, while the game's aesthetic and charm and look was a difficult task, that wasn't the only thing that Toys for Bob was working on. Another huge challenge and, and equally as important is gameplay and the controls of Spyro Moves About. So there's a ton of, of effort and smart people who are working at translating the metrics from the original source material, whether that was directly as usable data or through Observe so that we could analyze that and then recreate that in the Unreal Engine. That was very, very challenging and was not straightforward and no one you know, there was no blueprint to say like, this is how it's done. We had to figure that all out. As development continued and Toys for Bob finally announced the title, fan feedback started to immediately flood in. As time continued, Toys for Bob would then start posting on social media, showing side-by-sides of levels, gameplay clips, and more. This, of course, fueled the community to give even more feedback. Now, listening to fans is a great thing to do, and I think any developer should do that, but it does come with its own host of challenges, like who do you listen to? Then is the opinion actually good? And if that subjective opinion is good, can it even be addressed within the project's aggressive development time? We talk through each of the topics that are viable to us to respond to one at a time, and each of them kind of leads us down different paths. For Reignited, you've got fans of Spyro that grew up on the Insomniac games. You've got fans that grew up on like the Legend series. You've got fans that grew up on Skylanders. We're recreating the Insomniac games, right? And remastering those. So we're gonna pay attention to that subset more so than the others and their opinions about that. Um, I think the other point that we just keep in the back of our mind is that the amount of people who vocalize their opinions online, they are our most engaged fans. They are most passionate, certainly but also not necessarily representative of the greater audience. As we pay attention to these things, it's like, hold on a second, is this is this like five people or are we talking about thousands of people's opinions? Right. The, the silent majority, right? Yes, exactly. So so we do, and we, we had, comb through 
you know, all the sources on Reddit, on web forums, Discord, on social channels. And for each of the pieces of feedback or criticism or wish list items, we actually had many, many tables of Excel sheets and we would line by line talk about it with the appropriate teams and say, okay, first of all, do we agree with this? I mean, there's, there's fan interpretation. We're fans as well too, right? And we have our own interpretations. We're kind of closer to the material as well. So we've, we, we have certain ideas as well. And then second is how viable is it? You know, like I said, the, the timeline was, was fairly aggressive. And so that was a key consideration. It's like, even if this, like we agreed and it's a great idea, is this actually something that we could do? Another thing that we bounced off of is, is like, does this respect the original intent? Is this something that Insomniac would have done? if they were to do it. And in some cases, we bubbled up those questions directly to um, um, the original team there. Toys for Bob quite literally took some of the fan feedback and actually asked the original team at Insomniac what their thoughts were. And in my opinion, it shows that Toys for Bob wanted to honor not just the Spyro franchise, but the original developers Insomniac as well. And honestly, I think it paid off. After Spyro Reignited went live for everyone to play, according to Metacritic, it became the highest scoring post-Insomniac Spyro title ever. Not only that, Spyro Reignited's review scores were on par with the original Insomniac trilogy and scored even higher than the Insane trilogy. So, what's the secret sauce? What did Paul and his team learn at Toys for Bob when it came to developing Spyro? Well, first of all, Insomniac is an incredible team and their games back then and even today all reflect their talent and their excellence. That's probably a big, big part of that, probably. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I do appreciate like the Legend of Spyro series that they that, that tried new things. I think that's important for a series. And I think that, you know, they put a greater focus on storytelling and like Hero's Journey kind of storytelling and so I appreciate that but yeah back, back to the secret sauce I think that the tone is a big part of it and this is something that we've as we were collecting like a lot of memories and what people cherish about the game this comes up so many times it's relaxing it's an escape from the harshness of reality it's a world that invites exploration and discovery it's soothing it's low pressure it's enchanting it's whimsical so that seems like probably one of the main ingredients to me. This is just one guy's opinion, okay? So that's one. The second I think is movement. So Spyro's movement is so fluid and flow-like that produces this like relaxing kind of vibe for me. I think that that's really timeless and there's a sense of mastery even in that flow-like control scheme. I think that there's a lot of opportunity to expand there and I think that's interesting. And I think third is that like Spyro is one of the first 3D games, first in a sense, open world, non-linear type of game. And I think that the freedom to choose your path, the freedom to engage with conflict or not, I think that that's a big part of it as well. I think there's a lot of lessons that you could apply from modern day open world games that would be really interesting for Spyro. But I think like those three things like tone, relaxing, low pressure, whimsical tone, the movement, and then the freedom of the open world nature of the games. I think those are kind of like the three, those are the three ingredients that I would pluck out if we're to drop it into a pot. Now, even though Spyro Reignited cranked it right out of the park, it doesn't mean it was perfect. So I wanted to know if Paul could take Entropy staff and just rewind time, was there anything that he would want to change? And he actually did say that there was one thing he would have liked to do. <laughs> I don't think any game that we ship is gonna be exactly the way we want it to. There's always like compromises here or things that we missed. I think one very clear one that jumped to my mind is that we later patched in accessibility options like subtitles and motion blur settings and it would have been better if we had hit that at launch. Mm -hmm. Again, like I said, the timelines were aggressive. I don't know that it was actually feasible or Entropy's staff would actually help <laughs> us in that regard. But that one is the one that kind of like jumps out to me as, yeah, I mean, we eventually got there and we, we righted that wrong, but certainly we should have hit that one. It would have been better if it was earlier. Nevertheless, the Spyro Reignited trilogy was a resounding success. As of September 2023, it was reported that Spyro Reignited Trilogy sold more than 10 
million units worldwide. I then asked what Paul's reaction was to this. It's exciting, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very exciting. Um, we weren't planning for that number. That exceeded our expectations. It's a surprise in a great way. So now we're winding down to the end of the interview. And if you know how I like to ask my questions, I try to leave the juiciest questions to last. And so right to Paul, I asked directly the question that we all have been asking for years. Where is Spyro 4? Crash Bandicoot got a new game. Why doesn't Spyro get a new game? And I'm going to be honest, Paul's answer took me by surprise. So I'm just going to show you the entire clip in its entirety. But I, I agree with you. I agree that Spyro deserves a new game. Um, and it's pretty clear there's an audience for it. We've got some interesting times ahead for Toys for Bob and for Activision in a greater sense. Um, we'll see. But I guess I'll flip it. I'll flip it back over to you. Oh, Hypo hypothetically, hypothetically, if someone were to embark on on making that new game, what are some of the what are some other games that you'd be looking at? Now, I'm going to freeze here just for one second. I did not expect this question to be slingshotted back at me. And honestly, I instantly felt so much pressure. I didn't want to screw this up, but I took a deep breath. I calmed down and one game came to mind. In terms of tone, one of the games that I would actually look at is Okami. And one of the reasons that is, is because the worlds of Spyro are so beautiful. The environment is so pleasing. And in Okami, you can have so much interaction where the environment blossoms and changes and is hmm. restored. So that idea of being able to take perhaps a level that Spyro approaches that seems a little bit condemned or darkened and not looking great. And then when Spyro saves the day, the whole world opens up in a flourish to show the true beauty, to do a, like a level reveal almost, to add to that tone, to add to that art, to add to that whimsical relaxation is that anticipation of what does this world look like when we restore it and seeing that beauty and seeing that interaction mm. and i think that that is something that i would look to for a hypothetical hypothetical spyro title you mentioned that it reminds me of this game uh kina bridge of spirits has some similar blossoming moments as well yeah kina would be an, another great example because it looks like it's straight out of a pixar film and just like spyro so if there was Beautiful. a if there was a spread table I think uh, Okami, Kana, and uh, th those would be really good examples to look at. Hypothetically. Hypothetically. After talking with Paul, I am hypothetically excited for Spyro's future. But did you know that in the original trilogy, Spyro actually became a plot hole? Yeah, Spyro himself became a plot hole. And in this video here, I explain how that exactly happened and how a hypothetical Spyro 4 could fix that plot hole. A big thank you to Pollyann for joining me for this interview and a big thank you for watching. Bye bye